I've been on YouTube for a couple of years, and when I started, I would have never guessed that brands would be contacting me every single day trying to get their products on this channel. I've learned a lot through this process, and I've noticed there's a lot of videos out there for YouTubers working with brands, but not a lot of videos out there on how brands should work with YouTubers. I'm gonna be using lessons that I've learned as well as sharing some bad stories that have happened to me, and I also reached out to some other creators, and their stories are gonna be in here as well to keep it interesting and fun. You can see right here how it's structured, and there is a download, which you can find in the description below, a link to where I've actually laid out this material. If there's any discrepancy between the material and what I post here, go with the material because I can go and update that later. I can't update the video. So go in the description and check that out. Now let's get on with the video. The first step is marketing 101. You as a brand, yes you, need to know what you're trying to get out of this. So you're trying to do some marketing, but why are you doing the marketing in the first place? There's usually at least one of three things that you're trying to do. Number one is getting information out there. Any more if someone's trying to buy a product. You cannot just have a website with just your opinions on there and get someone to buy it. They wanna go and find reviews somewhere, they wanna be on YouTube, they wanna see someone using it, they wanna see a bunch of other people's opinions before they make that decision. And people are pretty skeptical these days. Number two, it might be just awareness. Maybe people don't know who you are, don't know about your product, and you're just trying to get that out there to as many people as possible. And the last one would be reputation. How is your brand viewed by people? Maybe they already know about your brand, but they think it's maybe stuck up or not cool anymore, and you wanna be associated with a new cool crowd or some sort of celebrity or creator. This has been going on forever in advertising, and there's nothing new here, but you just have to know which of these things that you're going after, and keep in mind that the different levels will cost different amounts of money based on how you approach it. The next critical piece in the kind of marketing 101 for YouTube is how do you want people to find this information about your brand or product? And there's three different categories. There's number one, which is direct search. They directly search for your product name, your brand name. They're gonna directly search the answer to a question that your brand solves or a problem that your brand solves. Number two would be general audience. You just wanna get this thing in front of as many eyes as possible. You do not care who they are which is probably less likely. And the third one, which probably everyone tries to do some variant of this, is a targeted audience. This is where you have selected demographics, such as age, gender, country, which type of device they're viewing it on, all those different aspects that maybe you have a certain slice of that you're trying to go after because you know those people are more willing to buy your product and they're gonna be looking for it. In case you're new to YouTube and you might not know this, all creators could actually give you the information out of their analytics that shows what are their demographics, what are the age of the people watching it, where countries are they from, what's the gender. Those are the things you need to be thinking about and knowing which one you're targeting. And that's gonna play an important part as we move through this to know how you're gonna go about it, which YouTubers you're gonna use, how much it's gonna cost. So this is step one. If you've watched YouTube for any amount of time, there are a number of ways that YouTubers work with brands. I've rated each of them for different categories of how impactful they are for information, awareness, reputation, as well as direct search, general search, and targeted search. And I'm gonna weight these here and I'll keep scrolling them through or somehow put them up when I edit this later so you can see what I'm talking about. The first one is just the basic shout out. Typically this doesn't cost a lot of money and this is where a YouTuber will just go either at the beginning or the end of the video and say, hey, shout out to this brand for sponsoring the video. This is what the brand does and it's usually 10 to 30 seconds at most. Just to let you know, per the YouTube rules, you cannot actually give them an ad and have them embed the ad inside there because they have AdSense and that's what YouTube does to make money. The next four of these, are often combined together, but they can also be completely separate. The unboxing is simply just taking it out of the package and letting people know what to expect when they open it. It's really popular with brand new items that people have never seen before because they're curious what they're gonna get and what the impressions are. The review is someone's opinions about your product, for better or worse. The demonstration is how the product works. And the tutorial is step-by-step -step instructions on actually how to use and perform different actions with your product if people are curious how to use it, and also if they're getting stuck and having issues with it. So all of them, you can see, have different amounts of impact in different areas, and again, you can combine those. I would say that the review is probably the strongest one, combined with some of those other ones. 
On the other hand, it's also the riskiest one for the brand because if they end up not liking it, that also means that that's gonna reflect negatively on the brand. Stepping it up a level is the integration and let me give you an example. I'll be right back. The other thing YouTubers can do, which Peter McKinnon just did an awesome job of this, is to integrate it in a funny way. A little slice here. We can take this Gorilla Glue right along the seam here. Ah, there we go. That would be another example of a kind of silly integration. Gets the point across, people are entertained, they're watching it. Anyways, lots of ways to integrate products throughout. Some YouTubers are better at it than others. The next one would be a brand ambassador. This means that you have a long-term relationship with the YouTuber and they're gonna be incorporating your products for a period of time. And they're gonna maybe show up at some of your events. There's all sorts of things that you could do with that but that is someone where you have a more established long-term relationship. That one can actually be very good at a targeted audience, also get your reputation up, especially if the YouTuber grows and is someone that's very respectable. The next two are kind of combinations of others. You can do a series, meaning I'm gonna do a combination of all these things over a number of videos. Maybe it's a duration of time or a certain number of videos. This is gonna spread it out so you don't know which ones are gonna hit big with views, but one of those probably will do very well. The other would be to do a package. So this could be a package of different types of videos. Maybe you show up to a couple of events, you make some videos, review, unboxing, all these different things. And then perhaps the YouTuber even goes on their other social media, which would be Instagram, which works pretty well, potentially even Twitter, and even if they have a popular Facebook page, and go advertise there for you and point them to these videos and the relationships. So there are tons of ways to work with YouTubers, but this is kind of just running you down the list of them. And every one of them has to do with what you're trying to get out of this as a brand. Part three is how much. And I'm sure most of you are interested in this because this Again, seems like the Wild West. You have no idea how much should this cost and how much is it worth to you. There's different ways to think about this. From a brand perspective, it's helpful to know what the YouTuber's looking for and how do they make money to know how you're gonna pay them and how much they should expect to get. There's a couple different things here going from the lowest amount of money to the YouTuber to the most amount of money, and it's gonna vary a little bit. But the first one, which is just the opportunity to be able to make a video on this and get to see it and use it. This is gonna work with some smaller YouTubers, but unless it's a really cool object, unless it's something that just came out and everyone's excited about, you're probably not gonna get the bigger YouTubers very excited about this. The next one would should be discounts for either the YouTuber or their audience. Again, it's nice to have, but it's not really bringing in the money to the creator. It's great to pair it with other things, but it's just not gonna, again, get them too excited. Giveaways can be useful. Sometimes they use that to get people more engaged with their audience. They can reward their audience with it. So that's something that's nice, but pair it with something else. Free product. Smaller YouTubers, when they first get offered free products, they get super excited. Hey, I got this free product. And then eventually, if they make really high quality videos, they'll realize how hard it is and how much work goes into it for that free product. So if you're giving something $100, $200 or less, that's really not that impressive versus the time that goes into making a quality production like a lot of these videos are. Now, if all they do is just open it and show it up, that's great and all, and that will be fine for their quality that they put into it, but in reality, that's probably not what you want for your video out there marketing your brand. I would say this is an area where it depends on how much your product costs really relates to if it's worthwhile for the YouTuber or if there needs to be a little bit more money along with it. If it's something that they plan on buying anyways, they're gonna go for it. If you don't know about affiliate marketing, it is gigantic and YouTubers make a lot of money from it. What it is, is they'll put links in the description or there's a special discount code associated with it and then the website will track where that link came from or who provided that discount code and then the YouTuber will make a percent of the sale or a certain amount per sale for sending buyers to the brand's direction. There's all sorts of ways those can work out, but this also incentivizes the creator because the more views they get and more people that purchase it, the more money they're gonna make. So this works as a win-win for both the creator and the brand. One tip here, if you are on Amazon, they do have a great affiliate program that's already set up through there. So if the creator's already connected with them, they do have to be at a certain size to be able to get into the program. But once they're in there, they can make money through the affiliate program by advertising your products on Amazon. 
I will say one of my frustrations with affiliate programs is whenever there's a website that has it, but there is no tracking whatsoever. So I have no idea if I'm actually racking up money or getting clicks or anything until potentially someone notifies me and says they have a paycheck for me or it just goes cold and perhaps they're pocketing the money. I have no idea, but that is definitely a frustration with affiliate marketing. So make sure that it's transparent of what's happening. The next one is the sponsorship. This means that you're paying the YouTuber so much money to show off the product, talk about the product, do a shout out, any of those things, and you are gonna give them money to do that. This ranks pretty high because this is direct money into them so they can pay for the bills, pay for their time, and all those different things. I'm gonna get a little bit more into the sponsorship cost in a second, but the last one would be a brand advocate. This one can be a big one for the YouTuber to see value in because it's a longer term relationship and perhaps you're giving them more money up front so they're not going around trying to figure out who to work with. They can just concentrate on actually putting that good content out and not be kind of sparsing their time around. This one, you do need to be careful with. Sarah Dici gave me permission to use this little Twitter piece right here. She's nice enough to do that. Don't overvalue giving a creator an invite to just an event. They do have to put a lot of work into that, especially if they're gonna make a video about it and them just showing up to the event and getting invited isn't necessarily as worth as much as you think it might be, unless it's something celebrity level, very high level, or perhaps maybe if it's a really small YouTuber that's just trying to get their foot in the door. Just be careful and really understand the value that you're really providing the creator. And since we're talking about money, don't forget that a lot of YouTubers put a lot of money into their equipment and their production costs. They might have to buy things to test the thing out. So don't forget that. So if you send them a really low cost item, they may end up going upside down on this, just trying to make the video for you. And if it doesn't provide more money through affiliate programs or something else, they're really losing money helping you out. And be aware of that whenever you're negotiating the cost. This next one is one that people are probably the most curious about because no one really knows the answer. This influencer marketing has picked up a great amount because people realize how powerful it is, but they don't really understand how much they should be paying or how much should it cost to sponsor a video and get that out there. I'm gonna show you based on some research, based on some different references that I have in the document, but it's gonna give you a rough range of how much you should be paying the creator, and it's a fair amount, that both you and the creator will win on this. The first thing you need to know is CPV, which is cost per view. For every view that you're gonna get, meaning people's eyes looking at your advertisement, how much is that gonna cost? And keep in mind that this is gonna cost different based off you're going for a general audience one or a very targeted niche audience. And let me give you an example of what that means. So this little, this is the Ronin. It's a stabilizer that I use, but every month or so, whenever there's a firmware update, I do an update on this on this channel. I have about 10,000 people that regularly, every single time I post something on this, will go out there, watch that video, and they are all either owners of this or looking to buy one. That is a very targeted niche audience. If you wanna pay, say, $100, $200 to advertise your product, and it goes on this as an accessory, that is a steal of a deal. If you do it just to a general audience channel, you may find zero people that actually own this thing, or you may find five or 10 out of even 100,000 people, where this is nearly a one-to-one -one view ratio of people that own it to people that are looking at this. So that, that's what I mean by targeted audience and niche. The cheapest is the shout out, and I'd say that varies between one to seven cents per view. And how do you calculate the views? There's a couple ways to do this. A lot of people do it looking at for that type of video on the channel. And again, pay attention to the type of video because people sometimes put out different ones that get different types of views. What is the average performance of that type of video on the channel in the first 30 days? And then use that as your mark. Now, if your particular brand or product isn't that time sensitive, it's out there for a year or two and you're gonna keep selling it, it might be worthwhile to kind of look at how their videos perform over a longer period of time than just 30 days. There's other ways to work this that I'll talk about in a second as well. As far as a full dedicated video, this is the review, the unboxing, tutorial, integration, all those things. This, you're getting to between three cents to 18 cents to even multiple dollars per view, depending on how targeted and niche you can get. And this could add up to a fair amount, especially in the example that I was just talking about with the Ronin, if you have those exact people 
Perhaps there's less views involved, but you know that those people are gonna go out there and purchase that item, and those are the exact people you're looking for, and there's really no other way to go after them with all the other types of advertising that's out there. That's kind of the range to go in, and keep in mind when you're doing this, those videos will be out there for a long time. I've had videos that kind of just sit there for a while and then all of a sudden pop up to 100,000 views. And also the other note is that I've had a lot of videos that I created in the first month of this channel. I had zero subscribers and it goes on to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70,000 views plus in that first month, the ones I created there. So if the YouTuber is even small, but is putting out really good, consistent, high quality content, it might be worth paying them just a little bit more to get them in. You're trying to guess on who is gonna be big later on. This is a pet peeve of mine and you need to be aware of it because the creator needs to be doing this for both your reputation and the creator's reputation, but they do need to disclose that they have a relationship with you, whether this video is sponsored by this or I receive this product for free, they need to be doing that per the FTC guidelines and that's just really ethically correct. If they do it correctly, their viewers will trust them still and it won't affect anything. If they do it incorrectly and people find out about it, it's gonna ruin the reputation of both the brand and the creator and all of the above and you just don't wanna get it in there. I will tell you a bad story. I do not do Amazon reviews with the stars for anything that I don't purchase myself. There's video shorts, that, that's separate, but for the reviews themselves, I do not do that. I've had people come and demand that I have to create a brand new Amazon account and send them that username in order to receive the product, even though I told them I would not do the Amazon review. I was tempted to actually contact Amazon about them. Again, don't, don't be that way, don't go after that, and try to keep your integrity. Part four is which YouTubers should you be working with, and how do you pick those YouTubers? Well, you can pick them based on quality. So what is the production quality, the content quality? And remember, although this production set looks really good, really what you're most interested in is the content that I'm sharing with you right now and how good is that content. So content quality is always better than production quality, but both are very nice and so you wanna pay attention to that and look at their history of videos. The second is the quantity of videos that they've created. Do they have a track record? Have they just put out one video or have they put out a hundred videos of high quality and you know that they're not just gonna disappear overnight and it looks like they're also not gonna go off the hook and start saying all sorts of bad things. Which gets me to the last one is, are they brand safe? Is this someone that you wanna associate your brand with, that you want speaking for your brand or advertising for your brand? If they go out there and do a lot of very controversial things, I would be a little bit concerned about it. If they do have a good solid track record, they have a professional way of talking whenever they interact with you over the email, over Twitter, or however they do it, that you can trust them. That's also the same thing to factor in. Now, as far as YouTuber size, I made this chart here. What I like to say is YouTube is logarithmic, meaning it goes from one to 10 to 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million, 10 million, and PewDiePie and T-Series are chasing after 100 million subscribers right now. You kind of jump between those levels. It's not like you jump between 5,000 and 7,000 subscribers and see a big difference. It's more 10,000, to 100,000 is where you see that big difference with the influence that they have. And also as they grow up that scale, they'll grow kind of proportionally along there as well. So that's just good to keep in mind. Typically, the views and subscribers as they move up there will grow proportionally. Keep in mind that this channel is not really that big and before it even got this big, we had some videos really take off in the hundreds of thousands of views and they still keep going. So that is not a perfect representation Again, go back, look at the history of their videos, look at what they're doing, how popular they are, and that's gonna give you the best indication of what to expect in the future. Each of these sizes within here of small, medium, large comes with their pros and cons or risks and rewards. A small channel, the risk is no one's gonna see it, they're gonna do a bad job, they don't have a big track record. The reward side is, is it might be pretty cheap to work with them. It may not cost anything, maybe you send it to them, also, they could turn into a big YouTuber one day, and if that's out there on their channel, you're getting a lot of advertisement for the amount of money that you spent. On the medium-sized channels, they are a bit more selective on who they work with. I've gotten extremely selective, and I've been told I've been rather picky on who I work with because I can pick and choose a little bit better now. But they also now have a track record that you can really understand how that's gonna perform and get a good idea. Now, YouTube is always unknown. You, you can't force a video to do well, 
but you can see on average how they're gonna do, and that gets back to my series comment of if you do a series with them, probably one of those is gonna pop, but you don't know which one will pop. The large one, they are extremely hard to get a hold of. I've been fortunate enough to be able to talk with some of them and get replies via emails and such, and they're super nice, but they get so many emails and things. And let, let me explain. Can you see, let me bring this to the camera, almost 85,000 unread emails. I do not have a big channel, but 85,000 unread emails, I'm having trouble keeping up with my email from just YouTube alone, let alone run my Twitter and my Instagram and all those things, as well as comments that come through. So they are just inundated with people trying to contact them. I mean, they're a social influencer, so that makes a lot of sense. But that also means that it's also harder to get a hold of them, harder to get their attention. So that is a risk with the bigger YouTubers. One of the other risks with big YouTubers, I think of Casey Neistat. Casey Neistat, very solid channel, very reliable, but he is gonna give you his honest opinion whenever you send him something. Someone sent him a drone, he went out and tested it, it wasn't doing that well. It went off and just kept going off in the water. And his end result on a video that got millions of views was, I would buy the competitor's drone. I've been using it for years, it's solid, I'm not so sure about this one. That completely backfired on that drone company. So that is a kind of the risk reward there. If they recommend it, that's awesome. If they don't recommend it and recommend your competitor, it would have been better never to send them that thing in the first place. So make sure you know what you're doing if you're working with the big YouTubers. The rewards though are gigantic. If they like your product though, there is such high exposure, general audience exposure. You also get that reputation where people wanna be like them. There are some brands out there that have done a great job at that. Instapot went out there with a marketing campaign across social influencers, going with bloggers and such to get their product out there. But there's different methods to do it and I'm gonna talk about the different ones. So dip the toe in the water is whenever you're just testing out. You're gonna just try a couple cheap ones, play around with it, see how it works. Quite frankly, if it doesn't work out, it's not gonna be the end of the world. You didn't spend much money. It's not gonna hurt your reputation, but just give it a try. The next one would be crystal ball. This is where you have a crystal ball and you're trying to guess which YouTubers are the next big ones. Which one are you gonna gamble on? Which ones look like they're up and rising people that's just moving in the right direction, but they haven't got big enough that you're gonna have to spend a lot of money. But if you put a little bit in now, poof, it's gonna be big. There's different ways to find them on Social Blade and different things like that. But that would be one to go after, but it's a little bit hard to get that crystal ball correct. There's a shotgun approach where it just spreads out across the medium to small, and you just pick a bunch of them and hope that some of them hit. And there's a lot of them that do that. They're trying to go for low amounts of money, but just the highest impact across all these different social networks. You can go big and try to work with the biggest YouTubers around and just know that you're gonna have to work hard to get a hold of them. You're gonna have to pay the big bucks, but it's gonna have a big impact when you do it. And my favorite one is just play the field. This is where you're working with the bigs, the mediums, and the smalls all across. You're giving them all an opportunity. You're gonna see how that works out and you're gonna adjust from there. And I think that's, a, that's an awesome way to do it. Whew, I didn't know how much material I made for this, but let me know in the comments below if you found this useful or if you have other tips for brands and creators out there who are trying to work together. The next one is how do you set this up? How do you go and contact them? How do you find them? There's three different ones, which would be self. This means you're taking it on, you're gonna do all the legwork yourself. The second would be an agency. So this is where you actually just hire some agency that's smart in this space, you tell them what you're looking for, and they're gonna go out there and be the experts. They know the connections, they know how to work this, they're gonna take care of it all for you. And the last one, which is pretty popular, are platforms. There's different ones out there, and I'm gonna list them off. There is Famebit, which is owned by YouTube, Social Blue Book, Relio, Grapevine, and there's there's other ones too. I'll put them in the description and also in this, this document here. This is gonna be a third party that's in between on a website, so people can put listing, put their channels down there and try to make those connections. They are gonna take some money and a percent off the top of the money that exchanges hands because they are gonna to try to make money themselves, but that is a way to do it. I've heard mixed results with that, and my best results have been either working through an agency that's working through the brand or working with the brand directly personally, but I have heard other people 
people that have had some success with the platforms connecting those in, but really the best deals happen with these longer term deals whenever they end up talking with each other directly. Like I showed you earlier, my phone is crazy with social media. And that gets me to how do you contact a YouTuber? And this is actually a lot harder than you think it would be, but it's also easier than you think it might be as well. Never, ever, ever do what I keep seeing and people keep doing to me is contact them through the comments. The comments is the worst way to do it. And you put your email address out there or something, who knows who's gonna find it. Just don't do it, it looks very unprofessional. Let me walk you through the steps. First of all, on your side, have an official email address. Don't have it abc123xyz at gmail.com. This looks like something you quickly made up and you're trying to spam me and steal something from me and I just don't trust it. Have something that looks somewhat official either from your business itself or it's your business name at gmail.com or something that doesn't look like pure spam so the YouTuber trusts it. Now, how do you find the YouTuber's contact information? The first thing I would go to is the about page. So if you go to the YouTuber's channel and there's a little bar across there, at the very far right there is an about page. If they've chosen to include their email address in there, there's a little I'm not a robot button that you can hit and you can go in there and find out their business email address and use that to contact them. That is a great place to find out how to contact them for business reasons. Please don't go on there and go contact them and be a fan, but get on there and contact them for business reasons. The second one would be is if they have a website, go to their website, they may have an email address there or even a form to contact them. A lot of YouTubers will have a form. I have one on my channel that I use and it has all the information on there that you can fill out to let me know what you're looking for, if there's a certain budget you're trying to hit, all those things, go fill that out and send it to me. That is just the best way to go about it. If those aren't working, you can't get a hold of them. Now the next steps. I'd say the next ones would be if they have a Facebook private page specifically for their channel, not their personal page, but one for their channel, reach out to them with a direct message through there. Do not go after their personal page, leave them alone. The next one would be a direct message on either Instagram or on Twitter. They may have it set up where you can't direct message them. So your last ditch effort is to go on either Instagram, I'd say actually suggest Twitter on this. Twitter's like the wild west of social media and put them on there, put the at and then their name, which is their Twitter handle and mention them and say you're interested in working with them. They're gonna send you a direct message through there and get a hold of you. Make sure that you follow them on all those platforms so that there isn't some sort of mess up where they can't direct message you in return. Once you find their contact information, here's the list of things that you should send to them, which I'm gonna get to in a second. But let me show you what Modern Day Tech has to say if he takes the time to comment back. If I take time out of my day to answer you and say I'm not interested, respect that and don't continue to send me emails. So here's the deal. If we take the time to actually write an email back and I'm really bad at this because I get so many emails a day, just the time to write back and then have them write back to me and say, please, I'm on my sixth email with someone right now trying to ask me to please, please review their item and I'm just been very busy. The best way to get their attention if you're gonna come back at them is start throwing some dollar figures of how much you're willing to sponsor them because they may not be willing to ask for it, but if you throw it out there, they may be willing to accept it. Just a little tip. What is the minimum you should include in that email that you send to them whenever you contact them first? First thing is you make sure to address them by their name. Again, modern day family man, take it away. Learn our name and address the email with our name. And if you can't figure it out, at least address it by our channel name. What you need to do is have your name it could be just your first name, that is fine. First and last works as well. Your contact info, what is the email address and phone number that they should contact you? At a minimum, the email address. What company are you with? Who are you working for? Because we don't always get that. A link to your website. We wanna see that you're legit and you're actually someone real. This is probably the biggest one that drives me crazy. Tell me what the product is and send me a link to it. And if there is not a link to it because it hasn't come out yet, explicitly tell me that one because the number of emails I get asking me to review items and they don't send me the link or the product, that instantly goes in the trash. I'm not gonna even take the time to talk to you unless you tell me what the product is. What is the request? What are you looking for? Are you looking for an unboxing? Are you looking for a review? Are you looking for an integration? What are you thinking about? You might not know what you're trying to get out of it. That's fine. Let them know that you're open to creative ideas or different integrations and see what they have to say. 
but just make sure there's some sort of request in there. And then also try to use good grammar. And, and I do give you a pass if you're from a different country, but the closer to proper grammar that you can use, the better it is whenever the YouTuber's trying to read it and understand what you're trying to convey or get them to do. And one little last tip, uh, MKBHD had posted this at one point here. If it's a creator that likes to create and they have their own style, don't suggest to them, hey, go look at this other video from this other YouTuber and basically copy that. That's not gonna go over very well. They have their own way to do it, especially MKBHD, he's one of the top tech tubers hands down and you're going to tell him to go copy someone else that's that's insane so just be aware of that creators on youtube they create that's their their whole thing so you don't say that you could say hey if you want to check out the product go look at this youtube video but don't tell them to copy it next up is the stressful part for most people both the youtube side and the brand side because no one likes to do the negotiation there are a couple ways to do the negotiation, which would be loose, informal, and formal. And what do I mean by that? Most of them are rather loose, and don't be so loose to jump back to the section we just talked about. Make sure not to send an email out to a bunch of creators at once. If you're gonna do that, use the BCC, because it's gonna go to everyone, but I get to see the replies, it's always interesting. But a lot of YouTubers will reply back with, sure, $50, or sounds good, here's my address. Literally, that's the whole thing. There's no contract, there's no terms. Most of them, honestly, if it's that small of a dollar amount, it's probably just fine. You have to make sure that your risk and the complexity is scalable. Informal means that you talk about some terms over email back and forth, but you don't actually sign a contract. There's no signature line. It might go through a different set of terms that you're interested in on both sides. The next one is the full formal contract. Maybe it even has a non-disclosure agreement that you're signing on behalf of the brand and they're signing on behalf of their YouTube channel or their company that they have because there is a new product that's coming out and you do not want them to disclose that until a certain date or perhaps you don't want the conditions or how much you're paying them to be disclosed to anyone, that's where it gets more formal. There's also contracts on maybe they have to send something back to you or if something breaks, who's gonna fix it? All those things could get in there. Here are some common issues that I've seen pop up between creators and brands. On the brand side, it would be, I sent the product and they stopped communicating with us. They removed the video after two weeks and I already paid them. Turns out the channel was a fraud. They actually bought all the views and subscribers and they have no one really watching this. On the YouTuber side, never ending edit requests. They use the content in an ad without my permission. They never paid me after I published the video. And then my favorite one that's happened to me, I post the video, it did awesome, but they never actually went to production with it or they ran out of stock. That's a lot of work to have a video that actually takes off and does well and then you get nothing on the backside of it as a YouTuber. So what are the different terms that can get into a contract? And let me get through these right here. There's a quote. So that would be the production costs to actually create the video, the lend and return, which means, hey, we're gonna give you this product. You can go test out, do all this stuff, and then now you need to return it to us and who's gonna be paying for the shipping. The feedback date, which means the date in which initial feedback must be communicated to the YouTuber. The first cut date, which means the YouTuber is gonna create a video. It's gonna be a draft video, not perfectly polished, but they're gonna give you that first cut, send it back to you so you can tell them where do things need to change, if there's information that's wrong, any of those things. And just speaking of that, I've had brands so antsy to get their videos out there that they told me they wanted the video in a month. They shipped the product, it hadn't even gotten to me yet, and they're asking why my video isn't posted. That's just bad, if you sign up for a date, don't bug them until that date's coming. You could just poke at them maybe once and just say, hey, is there anything that you need help with or any questions that arose? But don't go and start bugging them, especially before they even receive the product because perhaps they might say, okay, that's the quality you want. I'm gonna give you that quality. Revisions. There might be a number of revisions that you're negotiating because this could go back and forth forever and it's gonna take time from the YouTuber every time they have to make changes. So they may say, you get two chances to tell me what updates I need to make, and after that, that's the final product. Final approval. Does your brand need to have final approval before the video gets posted, or can the YouTuber just post it whenever they feel like? That's something to be clear up front. Quite frankly, unless you're paying money or it's a super high ticket item, I don't think you should get final approval because this is the YouTuber's channel. If you pull the plug on the video at that point, they just wasted all that money and nothing came out of it. 
So I don't think you should get final approval unless it's again a high ticket item. And you should be smart when you're picking out the YouTuber whether you can trust them or not. And again, this goes back to look at their backlog of videos and see how they are with everything they create. Publish date. This could be, you need this video published by this date. This could be again a month out or two weeks out. I would suggest not two days out, like some actual agreements say. They want you to get it done that quickly, which is fine if there's some really time sensitive thing that came out. On the other hand, if you told me I had two days to put a video out and there wasn't some reason for me to just spend night and day on it, my content and production quality is gonna suffer terribly and that's not something I want on my channel. I don't think you want to associate with your brand either. An embargo is the opposite where the YouTuber can't publish the video until a certain date because you haven't released the product or there's some non-disclosure that you have with another company. And so that's an embargo and that's an important point to have up front if you provide it to the YouTuber so they know it and they know not to put it on any other social media as well. Do you want it dedicated? Meaning does the review have to be 100% about your product or is it fine if there's other products? Or is it even fine if there's other products say in the background of it, potentially a competitor or something else? You should be specific about that if you actually care about it. Comparison, do you want a comparison video? Do you want your product compared to a bunch of other ones? Because those videos do super well because people are always curious but it also puts you at a little bit more risk, but that is something that people will ask for sometimes. Are you looking for exclusivity? And this is gonna come with more money that you need to pay. This could be, I shoot on Canon cameras, and if Canon, you sponsor me, I'm gonna shoot only with Canon cameras going forward for the next year, and you're never gonna see me with a Sony in my hand or a Panasonic or any of those other ones. You're gonna to have to pay for that because you're basically capturing them for a certain amount of time. What is the content? So you might have some terms and conditions that, hey, make sure that you tell them about these three or four features that our product has, and this needs to be outlined in your video. You could also require different things in the description, such as a link to your personal website, or certain hashtags used in social media or something like that could be in the contract. Post duration, now this is one on the brand side. And what I mean by this, I, as a YouTuber, if you're not thinking about it, I could post a video, I could get you some money, I could finish up the whole thing, and then in two weeks, I could unlist the video so no one can see it. That would be pretty rude, I've never done that before, I have no reason to do it. But to protect the brand, you may wanna say that the video must remain posted for say one year duration at a minimum. If the video has nothing bad in it and the YouTuber still believes in the product, they have no reason to take it down. I mean, it's, it's only a benefit to them to keep collecting revenue on that video and leave it up there. But to protect yourself, you may wanna have a duration of how long you have it posted. And then the last one is a license. So sometimes brands want a license to the media that's being created. They wanna be able to put it on their social media channels. Make sure if you do this, and there's been a lot of controversy around this, that you ask permission first and get it in the contract because I've seen a number of very controversial issues where brands either take a YouTube video and start advertising with it, or they pull it over and download it to another social media site. I've actually had some of my videos downloaded by the brands I worked with. They use them as Facebook advertisements. I've had this happen, I think, three times. A lot of times the music that we use in these, sometimes we only have a license to use that on YouTube itself. So that's, that's one of the reasons. Two, it's my own work. I did not give you permission to do that yet, so you need to ask permission to be able to leverage that. Same thing as they should be asking permission if they downloaded a video from you. I'm not talking about fair use, but the full video and put it on their channel, you wouldn't be probably thrilled with that either. So that's just something to be aware of. And by the way, they also may increase their price because they may have to use a different type of licensing, other music or other content that they add in there in order to allow it to go to other social networks or other areas. Woo. The agreement. What does this look like? So we got our contract terms. You figure out how to contact them. You're getting ready to do this. What does a solid agreement look like where money is exchanging hands? And as we get ready to do that, let me talk about one more thing. Actually, modern day family man, go ahead. Don't ask us to purchase the product first with our own money. Do the review and hope to get reimbursed later. It's not good business. Send us the product and let us honestly do the review. It's not the best practice to have the YouTuber pay for the product for them to get it and then you replenish their PayPal account because you could turn around and withdraw that back out of the PayPal and say that they didn't like something. It puts a lot of risk on the YouTuber and you're the one requesting them to do something. You shouldn't throw the risk on them. Here's an example of what you could do. So the brand 
sends the product to the YouTuber, the creator, the influencer. They try it out for a little bit, test it out, have a little bit of time with it, and then they can say, yes, this thing works well, or no, you know what? Not a big fan, I don't think it's a good idea to move forward with this review and, and video and all the other work that's gonna go into it. So they make a first cut of the content, they send it over and let the brand review it. The brand takes a look and says, hey, that looks right, the information is correct, uh, except one little thing, um, you missed this little piece here, that's not how it actually works, so make sure to update that. Content creator goes, updates that, they send them another video over and say, hey, please give me the final approval. They take a look at it, say, yep, good to go. Here's your payment. They pay them the sponsorship amount. Then the YouTuber then posts it online. There's the option for the brand to say, you know what, we're gonna give you a bonus. If it gets to a certain number of views, we're gonna give you an extra amount of money because it performed so well, and this is gonna share the risk across both of us. Now, a little couple points here those contract terms in this whole process. This needs to scale proportionally with the risk involved. So if you're sending someone a $5 item, it's not worth the YouTuber's time to deal with all this stuff. It's not worth the YouTuber's time to sign a contract and put themselves in litigation or anything like that. So make sure you scale them proportionally. You should be probably getting in the upper hundreds, thousands of dollar range before you get into contracts and anything a little bit too crazy here. I've done things that are pretty high up there that's been on basically equivalent of a napkin, the very informal, just an email back and forth, and it's went very well. The other thing is if there's a lot of large production costs on the YouTuber, it may make sense for you to give them 50% of the production budget up front and then give them the other 50% on the back end of it. So then the risk is mitigated again between the two of you. And that's how this really should be is it should be a win-win for both of you. And also the risk should kind of be shared across both of you and not all on one side or the other. And one last one, whenever you're doing the revisions and edits, and this one's super key, make sure that the YouTuber is able to be themselves and create the content that they normally create. If you clamp down and say, hey, it needs to be this way, you should do this style, all this stuff, it's not gonna match their channel. Their subscribers and people that watch them are gonna say, what in the world is this? This is just completely fake, it's false, it's not really very authentic, and that's not what you want. You want them to be authentic whenever they're talking about your product because that is what's gonna sell it better. Uh, come on camera, focus. There we go. All right, so now you have found the YouTuber, you've contacted their YouTuber, you have it all set up, you're getting ready to send your product. What does that look like? There's a couple things that would be great for you to do along with this. This has made a difference and does this set the stage ever that you know what you're doing. Along with the product, send a thank you letter. And this is more than just a little thank you letter, but you're being very smart here because you're setting the tone. You're trying to get the YouTuber to have the proper image of your brand as they're going through and formulating their thoughts on you. What you have in there is a thank you to the influencer. So you're thanking them, hey, thank you, I really appreciate it. Glad you decided to work with us, uh, blah, blah, blah. This is where you're actually being tactical with this. You're giving them the product overview to minimize the amount of work they need to do to figure out and learn how to use this product. And you're also gonna give them the features that they should be highlighting so they're not going out of their way trying to pick those out. The other thing you could do is give them some tips if there's some stuff that other people have struggled with so they know how to get through that and maybe they'll share those on the video themselves. And then the other one would be is if there isn't any issues pop up, let them know how to reach help on it. If it's you that they should be contacting, if there's some sort of support line, that's a great thing to do as well. Now, me personally, I love to call the hotlines and such and don't tell them who I am and I'll call at some random time at night to see how quickly they answer and then I just don't really have a question but I'm just trying to see how responsive they are and include that in my reviews. That's always fun to do. Along with a thank you letter which is either an email or shipped with it, you should also ship maybe some accessories or some merch along with it that they can use in their video, they can start putting around their their office area or their studio area that might show up in more videos. That's another way to make a great impression on that influencer, that YouTuber, that creator. Let me give you some do's and don'ts. Do make sure that they actually understood all the different features because you want to make sure that they know the product well enough and they're going to hit those high points. If you're doing a revision, make sure you ask for the changes all at once and don't just slowly roll them in. On the don't side, don't ask them to make false claims. If they cannot make the claim themselves, if they do not believe it, they should not be saying it 
because it will become unauthentic. And again, don't overreach with how the video should be done because it's gonna come off as fake. The YouTube community will know that and it's gonna have the reverse effect that you're looking for. This story comes from Life of a Mad Typer. One time they received a product, it was broken. The brand refused to send them a new version back and told them how to fix it. They fixed it, but in their review video, guess what they did? They explained the experience to everyone to share with them, to tell them that, hey, this thing came broken. I had to fix it, but this is how it's working now. Probably not the best thing for the brand to get their image off. It would have been better to remedy that before. I've also heard this from other creators too, where the brand's trying to be pretty cheap and not get it fixed, but that makes it right into the YouTuber's story. So just be careful there. We're almost done, one more page left. After you're done, they've posted the video, they've went through that whole process. Make sure to thank that YouTuber for what they've done. Let them know your thoughts. They love to hear what they made. So think about a kid that just made a cool painting. They wanna hear their parents say they did a great job. I'm not saying that YouTubers are like little kids, but they do like to hear that people liked what they have and also any feedback if there's room for improvement. Just be careful there and be smart there. Make sure to leave the door open if you really liked it. Say that we'd be interested in working in the future if there's any other things that you come up with, let us know. And maybe they're gonna come up with some awesome idea in the future. Also use that to network to find other YouTubers. The amount of YouTubers and brands that I've connected with through other YouTubers is amazing. They a lot of times have this crazy social network that you may not be aware of. They may be able to even tie into some big YouTubers, but don't just go to a YouTuber to get to the next YouTuber. Make sure it is authentic because they'll see that coming. There's a lot of them that get very frustrated when they're friends with a big YouTuber and that's why everyone goes to them. And the last thing, ask if it's okay to promote them. Go through on your social media and put links to their videos, get more traffic their way because you, now you're gonna be helping them out, they're gonna be wanting to help you out more and it's just gonna make a better long-term relationship. Ooh, that was a lot of stuff. Again, you can find all this information, the link in the description below so you can go download it for yourself. You can rewatch this video, take some notes, go along with it. This has been a ton of fun. I really hope you found it useful. Let me know in the comments below if you have other tips or you found it useful and give this video a thumbs up. You can also subscribe so you can watch more videos just like this one. This has been Paul giving tips for brands on how to work with YouTubers. Thank you for watching.